to to be honest when you started because you started with a whole youtube thing about two three years back right uh and then when you transitioned to to web3 at that time actually it was quite a tough moment for me in terms of entrepreneurship in terms of my startup and so on so so yeah listening to to those uh podcasts youtube interviews and so on were actually a, an amazing motivator to to keep uh, moving forward some stuff so so yeah no it's uh um, it was at a key critical time, and I know several other auditors and security people, security researchers, that uh, kind of align with the same timing, your podcast on their own journey. So, so yeah, it's a, quite a good coincidence. Yeah, nice, nice. Now, you mentioned your startup, was that a Pentestify? So actually, it wasn't a Pentestify, that is my second uh, startup. I exited my first one. And what we did is automated pen testing. So I was just like you, uh, um, I came from an ethical hacking background, quite deep on AI too, but, um, but yeah, focused on, on ethical hacking in, in Web2. So um, we, we, we did that and then shortly after, I couldn't resist <laughs> myself uh, in, in the Web3 space. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of the transition uh, between that one and, and Fantastify, and with Fantastify, we've been at it for about three years now. Uh, almost nice, three years. nice. Yeah. So, twenty twenty, you started the company. Were you a, uh, just exactly. a pen tester before, or just at a at a cybersecurity consultancy? So I um, I had been working in um, Deutsche Bank at Deutsche Bank as a um, um, cybersecurity specialist. Uh, before then, I had already been doing a private uh, pen test reports too. Um, so when I created, when I decided to create the startup, I had already kind of this corporate, this uh, very large corporate experience. I was based in London, uh, but I had already kind of tinkered with entrepreneurship, with freelancing. Um, so yeah, I just I thought that that would be the the, the next logical step. Um, but yeah, beyond, uh, you know that generally in a big bank you can you know, do this cross-divisional uh, experience and, and, and work. So I got the chance as well to add um, to the AI team because I've always feared AI uh, and cybersecurity has been my motivator. So yeah, I've always tried to keep um, uh, on pair with, uh, with both of them. Mm, nice, nice. You mentioned private pen test reports. So your previous job allowed you to go out there and find clients and do freelance work on the side? Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. As, as long as I didn't use any private information or as long as it, um, I didn't use any of the same tools or the same equipment, uh, with HR it was a mess, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, I finally got it because I, I, I didn't want to lose on that entrepreneurial aspect, right? So I was lucky enough... Um, and I always say the same thing, British people, um, if they see the value that you bring, even though it might be out of um, you know, the, the framework that they've set, they will most likely allow it if it doesn't clash with their own interests and you're adding value. So, so yeah, I kind of I negotiated my way out of it. <laughs> oh, nice. That's, that flexibility you don't see in many jobs. Like, uh, my previous job, they wouldn't allow you to go out there and do your own uh, sort of private uh, private audits or private pen tests or or whatever so i guess you sort of have experience in both the web 2 and the web 3 a private uh, auditing world how do you compare the two so the well f first of all they're com yeah they're completely different in web 2 i also did the oscp the oscp academy kind of all that journey uh the the, the hell of the exam but, well I, I actually quite quite enjoyed it the community that goes with it um, but generally speaking, the uh, Web2 security is, um, is a bit more sequential, methodological uh, than, uh, than Web3. Um, in Web3, there are so many things that uh, jump from one thing to another, from one contract to another, one interaction that shouldn't be in that order, but however, it is picked up maybe for, for maximized value, to maximize the value and things like that. So actually, the, the main difference that I feel is in Web3, you actually need to think spatially way more than in Web2. And probably that the fact that Web2 has already been kind of very, um, very much explored and, and, and things like that, right? I think there is a bit less flexibility for innovation and things that you generally learn at like these world-class exams as well, 
you're unfortunately not able to apply that to the real world that often. Uh, and I mean, uh, even even the OSCP team themselves, the offensive security, they are changing the uh, the whole curriculum to a bit more like Active Directory and a bit things that are a bit more, you know, under a certain framework rather than go out there yourself, explore it, uh, and try to, you know, um, memory or buffer overflow <laughs> this this computer uh, remotely, right, uh, or locally. So so yeah, that that's kind of what I feel. And um, and of course, the, uh, there is a huge need for Web3 tooling uh, in the Web3 space. And we tend to focus just on one very particular aspect of, of pre-deployment uh, pre uh, AppSec, when in fact, um, uh, there is a whole spectrum um, unexplored, uh, I'd say. Yeah. yeah, I've heard other people talk about the infrastructure side of web3 the auditing around that is very underdeveloped now in, in terms of market was there a really big market for web2 pen tests uh, in terms of just going out there and finding independent uh, clients as an independent researcher exactly so that was uh, i have to say that it was quite tough in fact our main differentiator uh well in, in web2 security just like web3 but web2 requires a lot of trust a lot of um, a lot of recognition, a lot of reputation in the industry to be able to conduct a full-fledged pen test, whether remote or on-prem. Um, I, I did several on my own um, to, to one of the largest fabs, so microelectronics, microchips uh, fabs in, in Europe, uh, based in Germany, and that was through a chemical connection, for example. So I had always, uh, I always needed to, to um, to go through common connections and things like that because approaching directly they were oh we just spoke to rapid seven you know that's uh, that's pretty much set for the next 10 years <laughs> so it was quite tough to 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 sneak in so the my approach was rather all right if i cannot um first of all i don't like the idea of trading my time for money even though as an entrepreneur i actually ended up on, on uh the other side of the spectrum uh well that very much side of the spectrum uh uh, as of now, but um, the the kind of the differentiator uh, factor was that I also knew quite a lot about AI and automation. So for things that could be automated, I'm not saying everything can be automated, but the thing for the things that could really be um, um, automated, that's kind of the continuous monitoring that I was offering, um, avoiding kind of false positives that they're super common in in these fields and things like that. Mm. So I guess when you were doing that type of work, open AI wasn't really a thing yet. Uh, do you like what sort of AIs did you uh, work with um, back then, and has it improved a lot since, uh, nowadays? Yeah, it's a AI. It's a, it's a funny. It's got a, a irony in itself as well because it's always been the overhyped. Um, underdog, <laughs> which contradict each other, right? Because um, there has always been a hype for AI. It's been very present in Hollywood movies as well. All the companies uh, want to implement AI banks. Uh, and even VCs, uh, they used to hear the word AI maybe three years, four years ago, and automatically uh, <laughs> say, all right, let's talk further, right? Instead of let's see you in six months. So. Um, I wouldn't say it was undervalued, but um, it was the, 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 well, how scary people were wasn't actually, that was kind of the, the underlying, how little people were scared about that technology. I would say that was the only undervalued um, uh, aspect that there was. Uh, in terms of um, what AI models I work with, more than I work with is that I, I generally develop models um, uh, in-house, especially mainly app and testify we tend not to use uh, off-the-shelf open source ai models uh, we use them for some things i would say we've got a solid maybe a fifth of all the models that we use um, we we got them off um, commercially open source and then we fine-tune them it is the minority though and we work with uh, graphs um, we do all sorts of new mechanisms in graphs in fact we get the best things from the llms uh, to the graphs such as attention mechanisms um, such as you know how to treat the data not sequentially but rather spatially we could talk about that later in a bit more detail i 
did a whole bunch at my previous company that I exited um, of deep reinforcement learning. And that is, I have to say personally, one of my favorite ones together with graphs. Uh, it is how I think the brain, um, kind of the AI that looks a bit more similar to the brain, how we think, um, you know, despite the differences, uh, of course. Um, so within that, I've worked with, uh, well, many different paradigms of, of uh, DRLs, right? Uh, PPO, DPPO, uh, A3C, uh, actor critics, um, multidimensional agents, uh, which is not the same thing as LLM agents, by the way, totally different. Um, and then if you want to play out with like these two big um, aspects, right, you need to have, you know, convolutional layers, you have to, to have regular deep neural networks to kind of uh, assess the dimensionality of it all. So yeah, it's, it's mainly focused on these two, but I cannot avoid <laughs> kind of the smaller models uh, that I have to use to glue them together. Mm, interesting. And can you tell a bit more about the your first business that you exited? Yeah, so it was this offensive security, this automated pen testing. Uh, I had already done a bunch of manual pen tests, um, you know, through the, not only through the introduction by the OSCP, but also uh, this, uh, as a freelancer, kind of these uh, on-prem tests that I did. Um, and as I said, I always um, saw kind of the whole, I always tried to connect the dots between my manual labor and how AI could develop that learning, that intuition to do that itself. Um, so what we did is we automated for cloud environments, the whole pen testing process until from information gathering to report, right? So um, the software uh, evolved quite a bit. It started as a vulnerability scanner management assessment and for the critical and uh, critical high and mediums, we simply did a local pen test to make sure that, you know, the team given that when there is a critical, the team, even if it's 1 a.m., goes on-prem or remotely if they have, ac uh, have access to and try to, of course, um, uh, patch that vulnerability because a hacker might be in, in, in the US, in Thailand, in China. Uh, so that has no rest uh, for sure. So we made sure that whenever we told the clients that they had a critical high or medium vulnerability, it was a, a real positive, right? A true positive. So we, we did that. Um, the, as I said, the, there was only one larger company, much larger. In fact, last year they achieved, um, I think they're valued at 1.6 bill today. So we saw them how they grew uh, from a smaller company from to, to like a multi-billion dollar valued um, uh, company. So so I already knew that I had reached kind of my ceiling in Europe. Uh, and in the US, there were too many complications to, to, to go into the US market, especially given regulations, uh, the, the IRS, and, and most importantly, uh, if you work in the US, right, then you're not allowed to work in certain public uh, governments in Europe. So, so yeah, I, I said uh, uh, I wanted to, to look for an, uh, an even bigger growing field, and that's where I jumped into Web3. No, nice, nice. Uh, and you mentioned uh, using AI to do vulnerability scanning and pen testing. Have you experimented much with just uh, training a, an AI and just unleashing it into an internal network and seeing what it does? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> we started pitching the wrong way the uh, the company at the beginning, and we only scared clients. Uh, plus, in Europe, it's not legal to have an AI that is able to take um, uh, authoritative decisions. Um, so, so yeah, we had that constraint. Uh, unfortunately, of course, I did. Um, I did create agents, uh, learning environments in, in many Linux very, uh, vulnerable uh, VMs, you know, Vuln Hub and many other VMs out there, or even retired VMs from, from top tier banks. Uh, that's kind of, that was our most, um, the biggest source of training and learning. And they retired because they found them vulnerable. So I said, uh, don't tell us the vulnerability, our systems are already trained. Let's train them farther, right? To uh, to accumulate this experience, once it goes up a, th a, th a certain threshold, it updates the parameters and the intelligence that we call, right? So, um, so that's the only kind of uh, AI that we let rogue <laughs> and learn by itself. But in real commercial setting, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately for the clients, they were too scared to 
hold operations uh, if ever the AI really exploits the thing, but now what? Now your company's compromised and you might actually open the door or make the company even more vulnerable uh, whilst you know presenting that report. So it was very super delicate to find that uh, common alignment, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I always wondered if something like that was possible. Like when I was working in pen testing, I didn't feel AI was good enough to uh, to be able to develop something like that. But yeah, it's interesting to hear mm. a perspective. Yeah, I yeah, know for sure. A lot of people, uh, and I get that because I've always been, well, I'm an engineer from, from base, right? So um, I always try to apply things. And of course, um, I, I've i had a very theoretical um, kind of education, uh, both at school and at university. And I'm actually thinking of doing a PhD right now. Got invited recently to to, to one in in a, in, a uh, in one of the best units in the UK, right? So uh, I've always been super theoretical, testing, uh, developing the software, and really knowing whether um, AI can can develop, you know, a better intuition than a, than than a human. A lot of people were taken by surprise by OpenAI, um, the creativity of it, the um, how what by OpenAI I mean ChatGPT, GPT four, and so on, um, and that is only a very, very small window to what AI can do. Um, people think that it's it's quite powerful, but only because it's got a familiarized uh, setting, right? It's simply a, a chat. And if society is very familiarized with something, it's definitely, you know, chats, chatting with something. So um, you can actually get, uh, get an equivalent experience, an equivalent uh, intelligence, uh, sorry, uh, with models that you do not see. They work in the, ba in the background, they get some sort of um, uh, patterns from different, uh, well, it could be from a smart contract, it could be from uh, big data, it could be from uh, market trends, whatever it is. Um, and it could be as powerful as ChatGPT when, when it's creative and when, when it's able to you know, summarize and, and focus on one aspect. So um, if already we can see that ChatGPT maybe out of 10 is level two <laughs> in, in, in auditing, um, I find it extremely uh, naive even to say that in, in 50 years uh, it wouldn't be able to, to reach level 8 or level 12 and by 12 I mean better than a human at that time so um, out of fear of that happening society actually just makes it happen that's uh, uh, if you, um, I'm, a, I'm a big mountain biker <laughs> so if in mountain biking you focus on the rock you don't want to fall to you end up falling onto that rock right so that's kind of the same thing about AI and society. We totally fear one thing happening, so we focus too much to control it, and that ends up happening, right? The only question is, um, are you thinking of the individual first? Is the regulation well set and things like that? And I mean, we can get onto that later, <laughs> but it's a whole mm. topic there. Yeah, well, it sounds like from your line of work, you've been working with AI for quite some time and it's been working pretty well even before OpenAI and ChatGPT came out. Uh, would you say that from your perspective, uh, OpenAI and ChatGPT and the like is a huge breakthrough or actually not that much of a breakthrough since it's essentially just packaging it into a chat? That's a, that's a very good um, question. I, of course, I'm not saying ChatGPT is not a breakthrough. It's already increased productivity of the world around 10%, uh, especially during a, after a pandemic, a recession and the productivity is higher even. So it would be, um, it wouldn't be uh, fair to say that it's, it's not changed the world and how people interact with, with software, with content, with generative AI. Um, I used to follow OpenAI quite closely when I, when it was, to be honest, when it was open. Um, they have a, um, a platform, they had <laughs> a very actively maintained platform called Gem, where you could actually train uh, DRL models, deep reinforcement learning models, agents, uh, you know, PPO actually was supported by OpenAI. Um, um, PPO is, is, it tries to approximate the policy uh, by an agent. So it's what kind of, it's one sort of uh, DRL model. And um, so I was very, very close to OpenAI, deep mind from Google as well, reading a lot of academic papers, maybe an average of three a day uh, for about um, 
you know, four years, something like that, because that was my only, uh, my main source of, of, of learning, uh, of creativity, and kind of to, to stand on the shoulders of these researchers. Um, and um, so, so yeah, it's come a long way, uh, LLMs. Um, I would say the big, big difference, absolutely huge, was from GPT-2, which was open source, everyone could use it, to GPT-3. That was when it when everything exploded, and GPT 3.5 and GPT 4 um, just um, are actually a combination, a packaging of, of more of the same LLM models, right? So it's not a whole different model. Uh, the fact that it has more trainable parameters, uh, it only means that they got they copy and pasted the same ones in a way that it works, right? Um, which is not bad in itself, but it means that the rate of development has decelerated a little bit more. Um, Generative AI, of course, has its limits, um, um, but we are definitely just getting uh, started with, with all of this. And this is only one type of AI, there are many more. And generating text or images or a video uh, is a very, very small portion of, of um, how AI could be dangerous. In fact, um, insecurity, I think, is, is a minority. It's, it's pretty much used for could be used for like you know the, the new election and things like that that are super dangerous, but it has very finite applications. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure from your following of uh, a deep mind and open AI, you were following very closely with when neural nets first uh, made the first uh, Go engine that defeated Lee Sedo at top a human player. I was a really big fan of Go at the time, and uh, I was you know <laughs> watching. <laughs> the broadcast very <laughs> intensely uh, every day yeah. uh, to see how that played out. It, exactly. It's, um, I think this actually what you just said is something super important for the future of our own happiness. Um, a special lot of people in Web3 seem to uh, maybe for, forget or uh, or avoid um, kind of other dimensions of life <laughs> um, and I get it because it's an ever-growing field and there's a lot to learn a lot of people to meet um, but um, when you're defined by your work by exactly what you do especially especially if it's manual work by for example manual audits and things like that um, you tend to you start to be defined by your job by who, what you do and what you produce, right? So when a new technology comes along and uh, I compare AI to, um, to the equivalent of well, a stupid example, if society, if all human beings were horses, right? <laughs> um, all the new technologies that we've had, the industrial revolution, right, just created better equipment for horses so that we could you know transport weights and things like that however ai is the equivalent of the combustion engine and then the electrical one and so on so uh, at that point horses cannot keep saying oh we've already gone through many different technologies and we've grown in productivity that's all it does more jobs more productivity uh it's a combustion engine it really a hundred percent replace the horses so um I believe AI aligns very much with that same kind of stupid example. Um, and if you get defined too much by a horse being a transporter, then they lose absolutely a lot of their purpose in life. And purpose is everything, isn't it? Especially in Web3 where I only see passionate people about what they do. Um, that's why they made the champ, many of them. Um, and when they see that, they can either deny it, so they're in denial. There is a whole graph <laughs> that explains the first stage is denial, then is sadness, then is maybe excitement that you might find another uh, um, solution to that. So you can either deny it or you can uh, embrace it. Uh, and most importantly, uh, AI is not replacing everything, uh, but it could replace the wrong things. So it's making sure that everyone is aware of it. And that's actually one of my personal missions, even at Pentestify. Pentestify was created just to be the spark of, um, and to be a spark, you don't need to be everywhere. A spark can only be, you know, 10% of the picture, but everyone is aware of that spark existing, you know? And as long as I'm able to convey to people the importance of, and the dangers of 
how blockchain and AI are double-edged, I think my mission is complete. <laughs> so, so, so yeah, that's kind of the whole background of why I even got started into AI. It's not because I'm passionate about AI. At the end of the day, it's like big data. It's dealing with a lot of numbers. Um, it's training a stupid model that then gets very smart, even smarter than a human. So, so yeah, it's it's about that. It's about exactly um, being um, out of fear and from fear comes responsibility and just sharing that with everybody. And it sounds like you've got a pretty academic background uh, with AI research and all that. How does that relate to Web3 security and how did you get into it? Yeah, so my academic background to be, to be exact is um, I don't like to jump onto new things if I don't know the uh, the, uh, the, the, not the surface, actually quite the opposite, the inner workings under the hood, how it works. Um, so instead of studying directly my true passion, which is cybersecurity, I jumped into, I did two engineering degrees. I started with electronics, I finished it, and at the same time I did uh, computer science. Um, so why electronics? Because I wanted to know how um, even a simple tensor um, which is kind of um, specifically made for training AI models, uh, hence TensorFlow, uh, Tensor Cores by NVIDIA and many other companies, AMD. Um, so I wanted to see how that interacts with electronics, how even individual electrons move in a chip to be able to activate a flip, it's called flip-flops, uh, and that actually um, states whether, you know, that register is on, is off, whether, you know, that is an active bit. So um, so that's how I started then computer science. Um, academia has many shortcomings. I've always said the exact same thing. I'm not a big fan of it, but at the same time, I only became a supporter only if you know how to kind of navigate uh, academia, right? Um, the same way saying university is worth nothing is the same as saying university is everything. Um, if, you, if you know what things to focus on, to respect, such as the professors that have been there for 20, 30 years, um, um, getting the field, advancing the field, you know, in their PhDs, postdocs, and post-postdocs, uh, and many more things that they uh, cannot even keep track of. Uh, you can nurture that, you can exploit that talent, right, and apply that to how you see the world, and hopefully it's for the better, right? So that's what I did, and then I, uh, I went to a um, university college, London, uh, and from that university, I got to meet kind of the co-founders of DeepMind, um, you know, Google's arm in, in AI. Um, there, is, uh, there are leaders as well in blockchain research, uh, in zero knowledge proof, um, FHE, and, and so on. So, so yeah, if, if you get that right, I believe it's super valuable, right? Um, but then regarding kind of the second part of your question, how I jumped into Web3, um, in my first company that we automated the Web2 ethical hacking with AI, um, we wanted to use blockchain as a database, kind of a precursor of Filecoin. Uh, I was one of the very early contributors of, um, of a database um, based on MongoDB, but however, that was decentralized. Uh, BigchainDB was a German project um, uh, based on Tendermint as well. So I started kind of learning what blockchain was uh, there then, um, it, it getting into the, the, the specifics and the weeds of it. Um, and, and then I realized that um, the, the whole automated vulnerability pen testing had its place in Web2, but it was already over-regulated. And I wanted to, to see a growing field. I couldn't resist but to learn new technologies that was around maybe a, a bit more than three years ago, so quite quite recent, um, uh, that I really started uh, getting into blockchain security, smart contract security, but why smart contract, right? Instead of infrastructure, node security, which is kind of might be the, the, the intuitional uh, aspect of from coming from Web2. Um, and the, the answer is that I wanted to focus on in an ever-growing field was not going to change, right? And wasn't that what wasn't going to change was the existence and the reliability of smart contracts for functionality in the blockchain. So um, I wanted to to focus on that um, and to 
bring the same advantages of AI to, um, to uh, smart contract vulnerability detection. So that was kind of the, my logical bridge between one and the other, coming as an ethical hacker, knowing how well AI could play into Web2 security and seeing how using uh, similar AI models uh, we could obtain the same advantages. And I as well believe that if you want to look at how the future could look like, looking at the past is, um, is a very fair um, thing to do. Um, if AI has become so prevalent in Web2 for cybersecurity, in Web3 it will be the exact same thing with differences, of course, but it wouldn't be stupid to assume that. So um, as long as you find your niche and you don't try to use it for everything, um, that's, uh, that's kind of the, the, my, my main motivation uh, to move into Web3. Mm, interesting. So have you found much success of utilizing AI in auditing smart contracts? Because the general consensus of everyone in the auditing community seems to be that AI sucks and it doesn't really help you in that <laughs> regard, um, at least for manual uh, reviews anyway. So what's your perspective on that and, and how has it uh, helped you? And I get that and I deeply respect uh, their, their thoughts because they're even more experienced in manual auditing than, than I am. In fact, I took the decision, the sacrifice, not to um, excel in, in public by not appearing in any public audits, public contests, simply because time is a very limited resource and I had to focus my, my efforts into, into uh, betting on this, uh, on this future that, that I see. Um, and kind of getting that technology out there so that it speaks for itself, um, which is which is currently been uh, almost at the end stage of, of development. I'm, I'm super proud of, of what the team and I have been able to, to achieve in that. Um, so the what a lot of people talk about, as I said, is kind of a very generalized idea of AI replacing a manual auditor. That's not at all what I um, what I advocate for, and that's not even what Pentestify is uh, aiming at. We are only post-deployment, right? So everything which is pre-deployment on the all, uh, all the manual audits, all the tools that are being created to kind of guide that security process whilst developing the tool, which is as well needed, it's another aspect of security. That's going to be as needed right now as in, I would say, five, six, seven years. Um, we cannot forget uh, the, the, the fact of uh, when we talk about how um, how future proof is manual smart contract security auditing, very, but um, it's a good idea to look at how manual code auditors in the Web two space started and what it's become of that. It's always an educated uh, guess to look at the past to say at the beginning when things were being digitalized, right, and big banks were being digitalized, and I say big banks because I'm familiar with them, but many other institutions to governments and so on, they brought uh, manual code auditors to uh, audit their security, to do a security review of all these things. So um, right now there is a slight less need for these manual code auditors because of the advancements of tools, because of the advancements of DevSecOps techniques. Uh, and I expect a similar pattern to happen in Web3. That doesn't mean uh, that um, smart contract auditing is not uh, future proof uh, that is the sector I'm in that is what I deeply believe in uh, but I only say to people that are getting started um, that if you want to to be future proof make sure that you look at the past how things have evolved to be able to look into the future and say with my extremely valuable skill set as a smart contract auditor how should I pivot how should I shift uh, slightly so that my skills are always up to date and most importantly needed in the world, right? Um, so we, uh, we do post deployment because that's actually where attacks happen. That's where you don't get a smart contract auditor to do another the same audit of the bytecode. Well, if you were able to, to, to get the split code out of it or if it was uploaded at the same time, companies really don't do that because if they already got a audit, uh, an audit uh, pre-deployment, they might get a, 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 an individual uh, private audit, a code for Rena, Unify, Sherlock, whatever, um, uh, and then that's it, right? However, uh, given that 
obviously that's not enough, otherwise attacks wouldn't happen. And most importantly, um, new attack vectors are being developed every, every month, I'd say. There is a new creative way hack of playing with, look at Viper, for example, something that appeared to be safe, all of a sudden created a huge dependency for, for um, protocols like Curve and so on. So unless you have a continuous tool monitoring post-deployment, you might get wrecked um, even though you were audited. So, so that is kind of the philosophy of it. We do not interact. In fact, we, we tell uh, the, the, the current clients that we are signing letters of intent with um, when using Neo, the tool, um, is we strongly advise so that you get a private audit uh, and a back bounty. In fact, we've already set out the plan for them to, to do one thing, then the other, uh, uh, recommended resources, recommended places to look at people as well. So, so yeah, we do not interfere with that. We support that, uh, but uh, yeah, but we we know that post deployment, AI has its place, not people, but rather AI. Yeah, what you said about uh, your skills transferring, for example, in Web two, we transfer from manual auditing to using various tools like DevSecOps. Uh, yeah, I, I really resonate with that because if you sort of keep your skills up to date, you really don't need to be scared of uh, new technology. Exactly, exactly. In fact, you get empowered by new technology. If AI is all of a sudden going to replace a bit of smart contract auditors, why not be the, um, the leading um, you know, education or the leading developer for that AI to get that intelligence. Um, it, it needs your skills um, and it's only going to output more things, right? The same way as the more automated the process is or the onboarding of security people are, um, if you already have that fixed in a fixed framework, the more vulnerabilities there are gonna be because the more you attract people to a focal point, even though you might be helping them uh, and you, you might be in reality helping them, that focal point also has its vulnerabilities, right? In fact, I don't know which mathematician said it, but for certain Turing complete systems, it is impossible to be 100% safe. So mathematically, we are safe <laughs> in terms of um, finding a vulnerability. And worst case scenario, even if you have a general AI taking care of many things, someone needs to, someone can hack, someone can influence that general AI. In fact, AI is super influenceable by, you know, wrong data. So. Um, so security is one of the safest bets for, for the future, for sure. Mm. Yeah, I feel security is never really going to go away because you're somebody never. needs to audit the AI as well. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, post-deployment. Uh, how does that work exactly? Do you analyze the transactions um, to see if they may be malicious and perhaps front-run them or something like that? So they, they're already great protocols that do that on the transaction level. Um, we've got the whole Arkham intelligence uh, uh, tools that you know, governments already use. That's already um, extremely well developed. Uh, there are a lot of advancements to, to do, but we are not on the transactional, on the kind of network level, so to say, how different uh, packages move along the network, whether that the meta, metadata of that is suspicious, uh, whether there is an anomaly in, in all these things. Uh, we don't do that, and mainly for a uh, kind of design principle. Um, not only because that's not extremely related to, uh, well, purely related to smart contract, that's a bit more transactional, uh, but also because if you look into the future of how transactions are going to look like, um, right now, data is public, is publicly readable, but in the future, in the blockchain space, data is going to be publicly private. Um, that is one way you could develop. I'm not saying that's the future, no one can predict it, but that is definitely one way. And it only is enough to read about full homomorphic encryption and how that um, um, makes MEV bots, front run, back runners, um, not be able to, to do their job, right? Which MEV is, is, is good and bad, right? So that also has its problems. If you're not able to kind of optimize certain transactions as long as you don't wreck the protocol or the user along the way. Uh, but uh, in the future, data will be in the blockchain publicly private for many, for more and more protocols, especially for CBDCs and things like that. Um, um, 
and uh, the the recently a couple of companies released their uh, F, uh, FH EVM as well. And FH simply means it's an extremely good complement for um, for um, zk. Zk mainly proves that well, it could prove many things, but one of them is that a certain computation that you did maybe off chain was indeed the right computations that it wasn't the integrity of that algorithm wasn't uh, manipulated or wasn't uh, changed in the meantime for a malicious activity um, uh, through circuits through predefined things that you cannot really relate back uh, to the original algorithm uh, from the circuit um, however when computing those things off chain right uh, off chain that already goes against the ethos of the blockchain uh, because now you're gonna trust the infrastructure but you're gonna trust that the company uses those models right in fact one of the things that we're waiting for zk to to catch up is um for very well advanced uh, machine learning models that have a lot of steps uh and recursions in in, in uh, within them uh we want to be able to say to the users that we're using these models these ai models and indeed they can verify that these models are being run for the service that they pay for so um so that is one way, um, uh, uh, and then FHE, uh, even though it doesn't um, um, kind of provide that security, that, um, that uh, zero knowledge of who, um, what aspects of the algorithm you're talking about, right? It rather makes data uh, encrypted, but in encrypted in a way that you can uh, compute on encrypted data, right? And hence MEV bots not being able to read it from the uh, mempool, so to say. So, um, so we don't do transactions mainly because we are uncertain about how that's gonna play out in the future and whether we could get a lot of intelligence from this private information, but um, as well because of the philosophy of focusing on one thing that is not going to change, and that is smart contracts. Of course, there are new versions of Solidity. Maybe one day, maybe Ethereum can run uh, Rust for smart contracts, maybe. Um, uh, I'm sure there are already hacky ways to, to make that happen. Um, and um, But definitely, if we focus on post-deployment, that means bytecode. Um, bytecode is opcodes, which is very easy to transfer uh, learnings from one blockchain to the other. So we're already speaking about multi-chain, even though we are purely training on one. Also because ultimately what gets executed is the bytecode. Even if it's obfuscated, AI can really know what it's obfuscated simply because the path that it does is not relevant to the learnings, right? So that is actually step one of the AI algorithm. All the obfuscation is going away. So actually, um, uh, we, didn't, we, we were quite certain of a future. We want to create, we want to be that spark, as I said at the beginning. And in order to be a spark, you need to be future-proof. So we just wanted to get that going and make sure that our own principles and philosophies do not change in five, ten years. Uh, and of course, longer than that. So, I mean, just the first step of using AI for de-obfuscation, that sounds like a really useful tool for MEV. Um, how far into the uh, development of that are you? Does it uh, work in terms of even um, de-obfuscating code that uh, people are trying to purposely obfuscate? So at the moment, we are focusing the uh, near the development that will release um, uh, soon, honestly, I would say uh, between three and six months, uh, will focus on, on very few vulnerabilities. We'll focus on three, uh, uh, two of which are uh, the classical reentrancy and uh, certain access controls with unsafe delegate calls. Um, why those? Well, not only because they have wrecked a lot of protocols already, but also because um, it is easy to prove how the best tools out there, static, dynamic, analyzers, as well as even some formal verification, but formal verification has really another place in this thing because that is very time consuming. You need experts, you need a lot of mathematical abstract uh, knowledge to create these proofs, right? These circuits. Um, but um, w we will easily, um, uh, and kind of what we have already developed in, in, in the virtual lab is um, proving that we are able to detect variations of reentrancy, variations of uh, different unsafe delegate calls, for example, where certain tools um, uh, that are the best ones out there 
uh, do not detect them or detect them maybe half the time or even propose that that might be something but they don't really explain why and the good thing about AI is that given that at the end of the day you end up with you might end up if that's this design you've done with a vectorized um, embedding of the whole smart contract or smart contracts um, you might be able to explain back from that embedding back to the smart contract where the mistake was right this is of course uh, quite new it's not the classical GPT API that you get um, this is uh, in-house models but um, we have already achieved higher accuracy for um, for uh, re-entrancy and self-delegate calls than, again, not to say names, but the leading uh, static and dynamic uh, analyzing tools. Um, and um, and yeah, we just want to expand it to, to 13, 20 different um, vulnerabilities, uh, vulnerability types, categories, and attack vectors, and so on. Um, and it's not only just about do we need a new vulnerability uh, detector? <laughs> That's kind of the, the question that sometimes we get asked, is about that explainability of how to fix it later, right? Um, it's about how those embeddings, right, that represent the, the vulnerable patterns, how they relate back to the smart contract and how that could be secured. And in many cases, we cannot even put a name to the vulnerability because that hasn't been kind of named yet or uh, to the best of my research. <laughs> um, and therefore, um, it's one of the advantages of the multidimensionality of, of the AI models that we use, uh, given that they, in every single layer, and I'm simply referring to layers because that's what people are familiar with. Uh, we don't do layers, we do nodes, edges. We, we Layers is like at the very last stage to uh, reduce and fix the dimensions by fix, I mean a fixed number of dimensions, um, we, we can obtain um, a lot more information than you know, what is possible to, to, to stay in our heads. You know, all these dimensions, all these different patterns, um, the AI after much training is able to uh, differentiate these, these abstract things that then uh, could be maybe a variation of an already attack. So, so yeah, that's that's what I have complete trust in in this post deployment um, uh, phase directly from the bytecode um, with with Neo with our tool. Mm, interesting. Uh, you say that's only applicable applicable post deployment. Uh, wouldn't you be able to just compile the Solidity code into bytecode and then run your tool over it and then act like it essentially is in post deployment? Yeah, exactly. We could do that. <laughs> However, um, we, we know that uh, beginning, especially beginning for the first vulnerabilities found and so on, uh, that would go against what I said about the importance of having manual audits. Um, we want, in fact, to, uh, to make sure that the smart contract has already gone through, um, through many different um, uh, audits, hopefully public and private, um, to, to be able to really give that uh, continuous support to focus on that continuous support. Uh, it might be able to detect uh, more pattern, more vulnerabilities than a smart contract auditor in the future, not at the moment, in the future. And we won't be the only ones, by the way, doing this. I already know other companies kind of tinkering with, uh, many of them tinkering with very advanced AI models and so on. Um, but it's, um, our value ultimately comes from the fact that our AI models continuously learn, continuously get smarter. So um, for the first time that we scan it, we might find only warnings or no vulnerabilities in, in that case. Uh, but that doesn't mean that as, as we train, as the system gets smarter by the day, uh, as we only need some smart contracts being deployed on mainnet and even EVM compatible chains, right? So every day it gets trained uh, and it's able to match that with the already patterns found in the smart contract that um, we secure from, from the clients, from our clients. So uh, that is kind of our continuous value and remediation recommendation. Um, LLMs are only, I would say, 5% of all the, uh, the, the AI that we use. Um, LLMs have their place again, but we don't use an LLM to simply input the text. Uh, we actually go to the weeds of uh, under the hood of the LLM and we get just the attention mechanism and the uh, embeddings. So. So it's not even kind of the whole output uh, that we were used to. Mm. 
so is it fair to say you're pretty bullish in terms of uh, AI models analyzing bytecode and eventually one day it would be able to find bugs that manual audits wouldn't be able to find? A hundred percent, yes. Um, not only because, uh, you know, humans, we do, we do human errors. Um, uh, I've done, again, private audits uh, myself and um, you really have to develop a very strong discipline to whatever is happening in your life. It doesn't matter. You have the same kind of level focus uh, that already uh, requires a lot of discipline and even we, we might even have a bias that we are not aware of and we um, we focus or we are more inspired one day, uh, some days and not the others. AI has very continuous uh, output. It even gets smarter and it doesn't need downtime um, or it doesn't get bothered by, you know, if you're in a relationship or if your job is very um, uh, consuming at the time or simply because you've been sick by a biological virus uh, and, um, you know, there is a time where you don't realize. Uh, all those things decrease performance. So, um, that's something already inherit uh, that AI uh, does uh, does better, um, and the bytecode in itself it's kind of the, the the best thing for AI to play. It's a lot of data, a lot of patterns that humans would take just simply a lot of time. That's why programming language exists actually to to simplify that whole process, right? Um, and um, being able to find new vulnerabilities that auditors weren't able to find is is a hundred percent the value that we will uh be offering to to clients the fact that uh, we continuously monitor and as soon as there is a um, something that makes their smart contract vulnerable we immediately alert the team and tell them how to fix it so so yeah that is our our main value prop um, for for neo mm, yeah that sounds super interesting um, i know you had a chat with d Garchi before on scraping bits and he is doing a similar uh, approach in terms of analyzing the bytecode, but he's approaching it in terms of fuzzing. Uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, smart, uh, it's a smart approach as well. Uh, I really like and enjoy my conversations with, uh, with Degachi. Um, I, I really find that his, his work is really much um, based on, on uh, very intuitional, so he's trying to apply that human intelligence to the tool. Again, that has its place as well. Um, fuzzing, uh, it is, well, the value of fuzzing is, is obvious. Um, um, and the, the you know, leading tools, uh, whether it's Foundry or any other, are really um, implementing that to, to the daily tasks. Um, being able to create new fuzz tests, uh, new fuzzing dynamics, is uh, what using AI is super powerful as well that only has, but you must be aware, of course, of the shortcomings of that. Um, that sounds a lot like generative AI. The best AI to use would be generative AI to generate these new uh, fuzzing tests, uh, fuzzing data, uh, unless you want to brute force the whole way. You have to be smart about it. Just like symbolic execution, you have to be smart about how deep you go. Um, um, Securify and other tools um, uh, do that. Uh, but we talk about generative AI having a focal point. Uh, at the end of the day, even if you keep asking different questions to ChatGPT to generate data, to generate answers, if you are an LLM hacker, you might know that uh, the data it was trained on, the limitations, and not even the data it was trained on, which, quite, which could be quite varied, but kind of the abstract focal point that it's always pointing you towards, right? This is why if you develop the future, we'll have, even with ChatGPT that creates code, it will have all of a sudden a vulnerability, a focal point of how that AI, how that AI coded that um, that Python script, that JavaScript script, Rust, whatever it is. We will find that uh, they all follow the same patterns of vulnerability. Um, and with fuzzing, if you know the shortcomings of of LLMs, um, and you complement that with some human um, uh, intelligence there as well, I believe there is a place for that uh, for that as well. Uh, again, in what has succeeded in Web2 isn't one simple tool, is a set of techniques, a set of tools that uh, augmented productivity and even <laughs> uh, engineered the, uh, the engineers engineer a tool that got them out of their jobs, uh, uh, given that increased productivity. You know? This is why sometimes we are slightly less uh, 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 paid than, than some, you know, uh, uh, some unexpected uh, professions. So, 
so yeah, I uh, I believe that that has its uh, its place. It's not the philosophy that we we want to. Uh, we don't want to um, to define uh, statically uh, to statically define uh, patterns for uh, what to look for and things like that. We want that to be dynamic, to be um, something that the AI can be creative about, uh, because scalability uh, in one niche is what ultimately I think. Uh, could um, could be the, the 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 ultimate solution for that very specific task. Hmm. It sounds like what you are trying to achieve is more ambitious. It's it's harder. It's way harder. It's riskier. As I said, I could be developing my street cred on public uh, contests uh, instead of uh, I'm betting on this. Um, I cannot be more convinced of of this future. In the past similar projections that I've made um, ended up being uh, the right ones, correct ones, and honestly, every day AI is is confirming uh, my inherent bias uh, to, to this, even though I try to stay as, as objective as, as possible. But ultimately, I, I do believe that um, the place of AI in Web3 security um, is uh, for this, when speaking about AppSec, is on this post-deployment phase and it's able to. Um, I was actually speaking of speaking of uh, the Gachi. I I said I told him uh, a very visual example uh, to to think about. And AI only needs about a uh, hundred thousand different handwritten notes to be able to differentiate uh, numbers. Um, so from a hundred k data set, you can output eight billion, seven billion handwritten numbers of people. So from a very limited data set, you're able to extrapolate that and it's able to tell different variations of the same number um, in a enormous multiple of the data set that it was trained on. Uh, that cannot be done with statically defined um, um, tools or rules because uh, unless you want to create a million long lines of code uh, tool and even so uh, your imagination will be the limiting factor. And I believe um, humans are very good at certain things, uh, but um, when 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 learning from huge amounts of data, uh, that's not our place again for 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 that. So I'm super uh, bullish on this technology. It was born from a scary perspective, uh, but I believe that being scared, with being knowledgeable, and then being responsible, it is how society should evolve. Because otherwise, uh, the biggest um, powerhouses in the world, um, the biggest banks, uh, BIS, WEF, uh, they all have a lot of um, good intentions, I'm sure, of the blockchain, of Web3, but however, um, they require maybe a bit deeper inspection and reflection of what that means, right? Uh, blockchain allows pseudonymity, not anonymity, but what when you have to identify compulsory uh, everyone. There has never been more control, you know, and that goes against the original ethos of blockchain, right? This whole SEC ruling, this whole uh, problem with tornado cast, both things should exist at the same time. You cannot avoid one and only exist uh, one way, right? I am of the opinion that everything has uh, its place um, as long as, of course, it comes from a scary, knowledgeable and then responsible uh, mindset. So um, we are just trying to make the, the, the most out of it. And I, I, can, I can truly hope that the community and the people see that because um, betting on this longer, more lasting, responsible wave that I'm betting on, instead of you know, more lucrative, shorter waves uh, that uh, maybe would make my day to day uh, uh, a bit better, especially, especially three, three, four years ago, wasn't the route that I took. Um, because of this uh, philosophy for for how the Web3 sector should move forwards and what things to to watch out for, especially when they come from from bigger institutions. Otherwise, we'll end up like 1984, which is a very uh, a book that I sometimes allude to very often. Yeah, nice, nice. Well, thanks for coming on, Lucas. It's been fascinating to hear your insights. Well, thank you. It has been my pleasure. I have really kept very close to, uh, as I said, to your journey. I've learned a lot from you and from the people you've interviewed. So thank you, thank you very much. It's been my pleasure.